I'm going to start around slide 48, 46 for that. So this is a study document. So we talked about the protocols, but not so much about manuals, case report forms, and databases. So we're going to finish this up for two reasons. One is I was asked questions about it. Two, there's some very specific Via Cruz information in part of this. That in fact, there's an extra training going on this week talking about part of what I'm going to present. And three, there are exam questions embedded in here. So this will get us started on the summary information. So I think you all got a handout for Bioform. This was outside the last few days. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. This is going to be an electronic data capture system, actually similar to a couple that I work with at the NIH. It's pretty cool. So first, we're going to talk about manuals of procedures. This is that MOP. This is how you kind of organize your entire, operationalize your protocol. Remember I said reproducible research, people have to be able to step into your place, people need to be able to replicate your studies. They're going to use these manuals of operations and procedures. This is every little thing from how you create the drug and the placebo to how you ship your blood out and the addresses. It's how I'm doing my statistical analysis plan. It's everything. So if you ever lose your key study staff, you have to hire new people. If they're following this book, they can do everything the way that you do it, all your data management, everything. So you also have to think, especially at multi-site studies, you say, but my team, we're a good team. Well, one, things happen to folks. They get sick, their family members get sick, stuff happens. But if you're going to run a study here and in Brasilia and a few other places or in other countries also, this is what helps you, not only do you train everybody on a repeated basis, but when they have a question Tuesday at 9 a.m., they go to the mob, and then they know how to do it the way they're supposed to. This is an example of the types of chapters in one of my mobs. It's actually not extensive, but we literally have intensive information on everything. We even have information on the study website when it's supposed to be updated, all sorts of good stuff. So, some places, and this you may see in pharmaceutical trials, you'll see a collection of standard operating procedures instead. However you want to do it, I know many of the different institutions and when I work with cancer cooperative groups, they're now trying to put together sets of these standard operating procedures and so they put those all together so people get very used to trial after trial after trial how to do certain aspects and then they just make changes in additional operating procedures for their specific trials. One thing I want to emphasize again is something that we call the facts of life or subject recruitment. Your early estimates are usually pretty unusually high. You think you'll have all these patients and then suddenly two days after you start enrolling in your trial, they disappear. The 700 people who you thought were eligible disappear. So recruitment is going to be more difficult, it is going to cost you more money, and it's going to take longer than you planned. So plan for that. It is like renovating your house. It will always take more money and more time. And I see a lot of heads nodding. So this is in fact the life study. This is a study that was done at the NIH. And you know, 1st of April 2004, they're starting a little slow. So the solid line is what they were supposed to do. And the dashed line is what they did. So we get to July, and the folks at the NIH are saying, we may have to shut you down. Like, what's going on here? You're not recruiting. You're way below. If you keep going along like this, you know, you're not reaching where you're supposed to be for a good long time. What's happening? We're supposed to recruit for only a year. So it has a long-term follow-up. So eventually, they made some changes, they got all the sites on board, they said, they're watching us very carefully and went re recruitment reports every single week, because I'm not a nice person, really. And so, and actually, this wasn't my study, but this is the type of thing, eventually they over-recruited, eventually they hit their recruitment goal a little late, but they overshot it, which was good. But this is what happens, things run slow and you have to figure out 
Do I make adjustments or not? And so you want to collect not only in advance reliable data about participant eligibility and availability, but you also want to think, what could I do? What, you know, do I need all of these criteria? And why are people not making it into my study? So you really need to outline all of your steps and you need to have and cultivate recruitment contacts to get people into your study. And you keep recruiting your recruitment contacts and keep them very happy. There are a lot of mistakes that get made. You do not want to compete with other providers. You do also need to know what else is going on in your area. Don't try to put the fourth massage study into the same town, run out of the same place, recruiting at the same place. You know, you need to make sure you have patients available that may be interested in becoming participants in a study. Sometimes people tell me they're gonna get 40% of the people that are available to participate. Next to never, like I feel that we have done really well if I get one in 10 people that are interested in actually participating in our study, let alone that are eligible to participate in our study. So remember that if you say you're gonna contact healthcare providers, you've gotta contact healthcare providers and keep them in the loop. If you're not going to do it, don't do it. But whatever you say you're gonna do, you've gotta keep following through on. If you're trying to recruit in a clinical unit, so sometimes you say, I work Department of Gynecology, I'm going to recruit for my department. Make sure you have all your colleagues on board. By colleagues, I mean everybody from the front desk staff up. You want everyone involved, everyone who's going to have contact. Don't take for granted that you're going to have access and can use medical records for research. We've had a lot of talk back and forth, or the samples that was brought up the other day. You have to really figure out in a time of changing regulations and beliefs about what is research and what is not, and really a conversation about this, you have to really think, what am I gonna know or not know? And I recommend that you do studies that everybody's enthusiastic about. Questions that really matter, sometimes the top person at the hospital is like, no, we're doing this. And as soon as that happens, you're doing it. But when everybody thinks like, you know, I've got a lot of other things and a lot of other questions and they're not always invested in your question, it's gonna be a lot harder for you to finish. Because you need people in the study. You do not want to have unnecessary inclusion exclusion criteria. You know, some people feel differently than I do about this, but realistically, I think try to include everybody and then work backwards from there. You know, do not include people for whom it is unhealthy to be in the study. But realistically, you need to plan well. You should pilot recruitment. Just like we pilot interventions, you should pilot all the other parts of your study. You should pilot how you're collecting data. You should pilot a lot of things. Learn from each other, share that information. One job in my office is we learn the lessons, the positive and negative ones, from our investigators and then share them with others. That's how you know, we have one investigator that the study participants kept coming in and when they were getting their follow-up exams would start talking about the intervention because the investigator, I'm sorry, the participants were unblinded but the assessors were blinded. And so we kept having unblinding issues. So finally we put these big chartreuse badges on all of the assessors and they said, I am blinded and it had a blindfold on them, all those folks stopped talking to them because it reminded the study participants not to say anything when they saw people wearing these big old badges. And then there were other people that actually had other badges that said like, talk to me in a totally different color. So that way if there were issues, they could talk to them. So little things like that can make a big difference in your study. But sharing that type of information, and that investigator is like, please tell everybody, this saved my study, it could save somebody else. Now, I don't particularly like changing sample size calculations, but realistically, when I'm trying to estimate sample size, especially in some of those survival analyses, I've gotta be consistent with your recruitment realities. If you can't recruit the study, there's no reason in trying to do the study, perhaps. 
You have to be really specific in these manuals about your laboratory methods. You know, there are lots of ways to take a chest x-ray. Don't tell me you're going to take a chest x-ray. Tell me, are they going to be lateral? Are they going to be to the side? Is it going to be laying down? Are they going to be standing up? There are a lot of ways to take blood pressure. Am I going to actually be measuring it three times and averaging it together? I work in a lot of hypertension studies. There are many ways to get very, uh, just higher blood pressures. And if what you're trying to find is a difference of say three millimeters of mercury, even 10, I can make that happen in almost every single one of you throughout the day. Same thing in weight. There are a lot of problems, so you have to figure out how exactly and precisely and accurately different topics you want to try to run the study. You need to be very specific about the intervention and about your training, the props that people are going to use, the handouts, all of this. Really detail everything out. If you have any changes in your documents and how you want to run your study, you need to change all of your procedures. Everything needs to be detailed, revised. You have to have something called version control. And you want to continually retrain everybody in what you're doing. Because that retraining, we drift in how we measure things. We drift in what we do, especially when you have staff that are working on multiple studies. This is not bad intention. It's just human nature and forgetfulness. I've got a lot of things going on in my life. I may not remember exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And then also sometimes there's changes in the community, and you're going to have to adjust. So think about what needs to happen, changes in regulations. So let's talk a little bit about case report forms. I have had, I had one study that had a single case report form, but typically you have many. This is usually a series of forms that are used to collect data in a very consistent manner, and you customize them to fit your study needs. Now, there are several examples. I mentioned Bioform, which is going to be going online soon in the United States and actually available worldwide. Several places in Brazil use this is REDCap. REDCap turned out a library several years ago that actually has many common case report forms that people have agreed to share across the so several case report forms I've worked on through, the, through Promise are actually available in that library. There are also a bunch of websites. When you look at the um, toolbox that my office has at NCAM, we have several example case report forms that people can use and modify as needed. This is an example list of case report forms for one of my studies. Got an adverse event and a serious adverse event forms, demographics, documentation of informed consent. This setup for inclusion exclusion criteria, it's a straight line. You should check off everything to the left. Any checks to the right mean that person should not be in your study. That's, so that way you can easily tell. You don't want to be rick-rack, back and forth, back and forth. You want straight up and down when you have to make a yes-no decision. I've got a medical history form, physical exam, prior and concomitant medications, enrollment. And actually, I think we changed that name to interventions because enough of my studies, I need to know how they're exercising and such, not just if they're taking aspirin. So enrollment, randomization, we've got a study completion form, checklists, which are not actually case report forms, but study checklists can actually help make sure you get all of your case report forms and get them complete. We also have a vital signs form. So there are lots of forms that can be involved. Sometimes you collect this stuff on paper, sometimes electronically, so eCRFs are more and more popular. Sometimes those are transcribed from paper, and sometimes there's direct data entry. I have studies that do direct data entry on tablets, computers, even by text message. The number one trick to remember is to avoid open-ended questions. You want to even put the decimal point down. I give a block for every number I'm expecting, because otherwise I will get 4 kilograms, 4.2 kilograms, 4.25 kilograms. So I have varying levels there. I, if I want a digit, I put a blank. 
This will help your statisticians and data managers a lot. It's a little thing. If you want a decimal, put it down. But the reason you don't ask open-ended questions is now you've got to analyze and use something called natural language processing or somebody who's good at qualitative research. You've got to get that information out. So if you have answer choices, it's more efficient to summarize this data. That said, sometimes you do have open-ended questions, but try to reduce them to a very small number. So what do you do for a case report form? You do design the form to collect all your relevant data. It needs to be in accord with the protocol. You want to facilitate the efficient and complete data collection, data processing, and analysis for your study. You also want to try to facilitate the pooling of data across studies. I know in the acupuncture community and in several other communities, especially in neurological diseases, they have sat down and said, we will have common data elements across every single one of our studies. We're going to try to use the same measure on the same time frames in order to collect that data so we can more easily do those meta regressions that Chuck was talking about. We actually want to formally combine data across studies to try to get some answers. You need to provide the units of measure whether it's in pounds, kilos, exactly how should it be measured. Very important for multi-site studies. You know, when I show up and I look at something, I say, really? That 60-year-old man, he weighs 69 pounds? Okay. You know, probably they should have put kilos instead. These are the types of things, and even then, I was kind of like, really? Sure you're not missing a number somewhere? These are the things we have to think about. So provide your units, include very clear instructions on completion. You want to have the participant identification number, the study name, and any contact information on each form. You do not want the human being's name on the form of the participant in the study. Their name, no, their ID number, yes. Do not collect the same data repeatedly, especially on the same form. You want to help ease and do things quickly and efficiently. Anything that can be calculated, you know, give me their weight, give me their height, the computer can calculate the body mass index. If you're gonna collect blood pressure three times, just have systolic, diastolic one, systolic, diastolic two, systolic, diastolic three, the computer can compute the mean. Don't put the participants' names on the case report forms. This needs to be your vehicle for consistent data collection. You need to outline and make sure everybody knows how to use your forms, that they're going to do it on a consistent schedule. Sometimes the order in which you are doing your case report forms matters. So if I'm asking people about physical function and then about emotional health, you may need to have a certain order to your forms, because especially on self-report, or, you know, for example, what do you do first? Take their blood or take their blood pressure on the same arm. You need to think about what problems could come up, and I say that because blood, when squirted out, order does matter. So format your forms. The forms on paper, if you're using it, should match the way the form looks on the computer screen when people are typing the data in. That will save you a lot of data entry errors. There are a whole bunch of good clinical practice guidelines on this, and so go ahead, use those. Sample instructions coming out of there, use a 24-hour clock. Typically, if you can do that, it will save you trouble. Be very careful about abbreviations. And if you are correcting errors, you should be writing a single line through the erroneous entry and recording the data, the initials of the person doing the correction. If you're doing corrections electronically, you need to have audit trails set up. So you need to have audit trails anyway. So data flow, data entry, data correction procedures, this is all part of that manual of procedures and part of how you're dealing with your data. And it is the site's responsibility to ensure all these forms are complete, intact, and transmitted as necessary. You need to have a schedule for how to do this. 
Typically within 48 hours of seeing a study participant, I want my data in that computer. And then I want it checked. Some of my studies, I've done that in a week, very, very rarely two weeks, but you need to build in what is your time frame, and if you have known exceptions, what those exceptions are. This is the type of stuff you're gonna get asked for in a lot of studies, so make sure you know how to do it. Make sure you know how you're maintaining those forms, especially if you have paper forms, and how they're going to be kept safe. So this is BioForm. This is an electronic case report form system. So we have this in REDCap, and we also have something similar in um, the assessment center. But Via Cruz has put this together, and I have contact information on the next slide. They're basically customizing different studies at the same time. So your unit can sign up for this and basically run in a web environment. And it's all developed in Portuguese, I should add. Run in a web environment all of your electronic data capture. It also has a lot of other study management properties built in. So they have a lot of validation processes, auditing processes, comparisons, and right now they are running a study that should be done by the end of the year to see if they're actually getting different data when they do all the collection on paper form and then run it through teleform, or if they do this electronic data capture. So what's nice is you can also set up, you know, for your unit kind of general parameters in the system and then study profiles and then specialize each study. So you don't have to start each study from scratch. You will also be able to do randomization through the system and there are a lot of tools for all of your auditing and monitoring and to export that data. So speaking of data management, there are a lot of expectations. These days, there are tons of international and national rules on what should go into informatics and how to handle this data. No longer can you go get the most computer literate person who's your friend a couple of doors down and have them build your database. You now need to get somebody who really is well trained in how to do this to think about the best way to have your management system, how to collect it, and all these guidelines. This is now a new science that has come up. Find somebody who knows the field, who knows the regulations, hire a professional to do this. That is some of the best advice I can give you right now. There are a lot of retractions right now due to poor data management. So what is this? Here's a whole list of what goes into data management. Again, stuff we used to make, you know, the younger people in our study used to do all this stuff. That's the first job I had it, that was biostatistical in nature. I was data manager. I had no idea what I was doing. Although it did make me switch from mathematics to biostatistics, so it did something. But that database lock, so not only are they doing data entry formats and creating the databases, quality control and management, they're cleaning data. They're creating those interim data sets for all of these reports that have to go to your monitoring committee. They're locking the different parts of the database and creating data sets for manuscript preparation and data storage. And they should be involved in developing the protocol and operating procedures because in the end, if it's not in that database, it doesn't get analyzed and put into your manuscripts. Data sitting on a sheet of paper somewhere or in somebody's notes or in their head doesn't exist. So there are a lot of expectations on tracking data entry and editing, how the audit trail should be set up or not, all this transmission. This is a new and emerging world, but one that every one of us has to be involved in. They do all these different checks. There's some that you can automate, but I will say, in the end, you know, some numbers, if you flip them, could both, you know, they're not gonna fall out of an expected range. So in the end, going back and physically checking that the numbers are right and that it matches the originally collected data is important. But how do you do that if you are direct entering the information through a computer. So there are a lot of weird steps and things you have to think about here. Each participant should have their own study record. Usually it's locked in some area when it's not in use, although again, if it's gonna be on a computer server somewhere, how do you make that happen? 
you need to have a code number for each participant. I will say, so I recently got a protocol I was looking at the other night, and the way that they are developing the code numbers, I could re-identify almost everybody in the study. I was like, well, that doesn't actually work. <laughs> Good idea, try again. So you do need to think. Remember, part of this is to protect, to have privacy. So you need to think about it. if you're really accomplishing your goal, similar to randomization, are you really accomplishing the goal of what you're supposed to do? If you need multiple data sources, you may need a lot of separate forms and even different databases. That's OK. But sometimes we have transmittal forms. We have a lot of different ways to make sure the data has gone and been entered the way it needed to be. I'm going to skip over the data entry rules, but these were written by my friend Dan Byrne at Vanderbilt. I do recommend that you read them because it will prevent you from sending your statisticians, if you dare to use Excel, what we like to call the spreadsheet from hell. So we've all seen this, you know, here's all the information on drug A and drug B, you know, in that blinded study where you weren't supposed to know who was on each drug. Age of the patient, I get, you know, 65 plus, question marks, unknown, six months instead of 65 years, sometimes capitals, sometimes letters, sometimes nothing, centimeters, feet. This is a mess. I can't analyze this. I'm going to spend hours, and I charge a lot per hour. I'm going to spend hours trying to work this out. This is what we want our data sheets to look like. And even if you're in a big fancy database, it pretty much comes down to this. And there's going to be a nice little sheet somewhere that tells me exactly, you know, when somebody says sex is one, is that a male or a female? Sex is two, is that a male or a female? You know, what are these zeros and ones? But somewhere it will tell me this information. And I'm good with that. So if you want to learn more about Bioform, talk to Elizabeth. She's actually a few buildings over giving the workshop. If you want to learn more about REDCap, this is the Research Electronic Data Capture System. It was started at Vanderbilt, but there are over 400 institutional partners around the world. They actually, every Friday, they have additional trainings. This is a secure web application, and they have many, many thousands of projects going on. I will say that it is a little more complicated in some ways. I even, I know folks that have been able to put this into their own research units, but usually you do need some informatics support and updating on your own to keep REDCap going well. We also at the NIH offer something called the Assessment Center. This is an online research management tool that you can also bring into your own institution. Here, again, like REDCap, you can create study-specific websites, capture participant data, securely. We actually developed this in order to be able to push out our patient reported outcome measurement information system instruments. So these were self-report short forms and computer adaptive tests. But we've now expanded this and you can actually put any type of case report form you want. One of my students is running their animal study using all of their data capture through assessment center. That's where they're storing their data because I convinced them not to use Excel on their home computer. You also, in all of these systems, you can get automated accrual reports for many of the major funders, and you can also capture endorsement of online consent. Which leads me to the fact that Excel is not a database. Excel is not a database. Everybody please say that, and then I'll feel a little bit better. There is no auditing feature in Excel. Also, um, as a conversation was happening among your faculty this week, dates are stored in a certain way if you're using Mac versus PC. So especially if you have to transfer data between different like basic computer operating systems, your data will change. That's not the type of change you want to see in your clinical research study. So be really careful. So there's some information on this that I put in your notes. But realistically, it's very easy to accidentally type something and change your data in Excel. So you may have looked every single time. When an investigator of mine says they're going to use Excel, I'm like, well, the very last thing you're going to do, because no statistician is going to probably use Excel for something like this, you're going to transfer that data. I don't care if it's to SAS 
to S plus to R, you're going to transfer it to some other data system, turn on the auditing program, and do a 100% clean and check of your data. And that usually convinces them to try to find a different program to store their data in. Now, I use Excel, but I do not use it for my clinical research studies. So here, somebody had asked me for data management resources. They said there are no good books on how to do this. Well, that is because they are just now starting to come out, although some of these are already into second edition. These are the ones that the data managers tell me that they like. So I talked to a bunch of data managers. These are their three main books that they recommend. But again, there are a lot of training programs now. So your takeaway, consistency matters. Consistency across all of your study documents is key. Make sure that also when you are getting information from all of these different funders and regulatory agencies and all these other groups that are going to be overseeing, you're going to have to put all this together because ultimately you have one set of study documents and everybody has to agree with what's going on. Commonly missing study design elements. I commonly see that people do not talk about recruitment and retention in their documents. You need to pay attention to that. They don't talk about how they chose their dose or they don't even try to choose a dose. Designing the right control group, how you decided that was your control group and why you didn't use a different type of control group. They also tend to forget the information about randomization, about blinding, data capture, data management, and overall study quality control. How you're going to make sure people are really sticking to the protocol, that if changes need to be made, that they're documented, that the training's updated, how you're going to keep on top of this. In conclusion, everything has to make sense. When you read it, it should all make sense. Everything should flow. Your study needs to be correctly staffed. That's hard, especially if you're a new investigator. There are not a lot of people working there. You don't have a lot of money. But many times you may do a pilot, realize your limitations, and move on to a better staffed study. But if you never ask for the funding or don't try to get the staff, that is the problem. You need something that is going to be implementable within your resources that's practical but still rigorous. And you need to have those testable hypotheses that address the aims and the goals of your research. And that really are going to be moving science and health and public health forward. So at the end of the lecture, there are tons of resources. I'm not going to go through those because now we're going to go through the rest of the summary. So you put the statistician in charge of your review, you get about 70% statistics. Although the ethicists have always told me they think that's fine because they think people have more trouble understanding the statistical aspects and that the ethics just makes sense. I'm not 100% sure about that all the time, but also I blame Chuck, or rather I blame my video, um, because a lot of what we're going to cover is actually meta-analysis. So. First things first, I think I will be answering by the end of this, either in our lectures or after this, I will have answered everybody's questions that got passed to me. But if not, you all can correct me on that. I'm sure you will. And also, just because I don't cover something right now does not mean it's unimportant. I was trying to make sure I answered everybody's questions. So there's a higher emphasis on that. We don't do something during this week unless we think it is important. And that is true for all of the different speakers. So you know, if you say, oh good, something's not in here. Either I forgot it last night or other material had to go in instead. So don't say, now I know exactly what's on the exam. That is wrong. Oh, except I just skipped a slide. So we have design and analysis. So we started off with a whole bunch of lectures. You've had them throughout the week. We've talked about clinical study design, observational studies, 
Louise is here in the front row now, we have a lot of epidemiology. We also have hypothesis testing, randomization, sample size and power, a lot on descriptive statistics and different types of variables and measures. We talked about meta-analysis, meta-regression, and survival analysis. We also talked about ethics in design, the ethical principles in clinical research, your scientific integrity and conflicts of interest, institutional review boards, data safety monitoring, and how you interact between all these groups. Study documents, we just talked a little bit about that, and therapeutic misalignment, and how you try to report these results. These are kind of our big themes. We also had some specialty topics that dug in to very specific work. We had great speakers all week, and actually Flavia is still here, so thank you. We had biorepositories and biobanks, and I think that speaker's taking the exam with you all today also. Evaluation of health programs, we talked a lot about that and the different ways that you could go about that, both in randomized ways and non-randomized ways. We had our speaker from Conepe. We had talks that were very specific about how one researcher in Brazil has built an entire research infrastructure and interacts on an international level with really good information on how you can do similar work in your own areas. We talked a lot about translational research and then today also about the regulatory issues. From what I've heard, this is a really exciting time to be a clinical researcher here in Brazil. So I hope all of you all are coming away not just tired because it's been a long and intensive week, but also excited about where this country is going and where health on a world level is going to be going. There's a lot that's scary, but there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of good that I think talking to many of you this week that you all can do. So what are the designs? We talked about randomized and non-randomized designs. Sometimes when we have interventions and sometimes that we're just observing. We talked about prospective, so looking forward, and retrospective, when we look at data that's already been collected in the past. Those cross-sectional surveys, those snippets in time, and then also following people over a long period of time. We talked about different ways that you could have blinded or mass studies, and some of the issues that come up when you have unblinded studies, but then also some cases where you don't have a choice and you must have an unblinded study. We've discussed some of the motivations behind randomization, that randomization is really trying to ensure that only one factor is different when you're comparing your different study groups, that we're only changing and testing one thing, and that by doing that, we actually have a basis for valid statistical tests between the different treatment groups. This means that we can attribute causality between, so that that between group differences, those outcomes can be attributed to those interventions, those treatments we're giving them. Now in truth, does randomization guarantee causality? No, nothing is guaranteed. Everything we're trying to do is to increase the likelihood that in this case, causality is the main driving factor. We're always trying to improve. We cannot 100% eliminate bias, for example but we can try to minimize the impacts. Also a key element is that without the intent to treat analysis, the benefits of randomization really are weakened. And so while a lot of people want to do per protocol analyses, sometimes you may need to plan multiple analyses in order to be able to accomplish what you need. There are a lot of imp important features to randomization. We have random allocation, so there's this idea that you have this known chance of receiving a treatment, but you can't predict that treatment that's going to be given to a single individual. You want to have the reproducibility of that randomization scheme. The idea, again, we're going to reduce the selection into the study arm, at least, of bias when allocating people to study arms. That's one of the points behind randomization. Yes, I understand some folks, we don't know who's going to come into the study. We have to work on that random sampling to try to get an appropriate mix of people in there to even randomize. But realistically, randomization keeps us from you know, 
putting, we're going to try not to put the more sick people on one arm and the less sick people on the other. So we're trying to actually minimize the selection bias into the study arms. In double-blinded trials, we hope what we're trying to eliminate is that response or evaluation bias. This is an important element. And our idea here behind randomization is that the patient characteristics will tend to be balanced across those study arms. And that the chance baseline imbalances between groups may still occur, but it'll be by chance. And that's one of the important elements here. So what about statistical inference? I know, we like to use these big words. Inference is about the population. All this research we're doing is not usually about just the people in our study. It's about the larger group of people. So it's about the population. Inference is about a population that's made on the basis of the results obtained from that sample that's in your study that you drew for that population. So we talked a lot about hypotheses. That null hypothesis for the superiority trials, where essentially you might be saying, you know, the mean in each of your two groups is equal. We told you to do a two-sided test almost always, and that that alternative is going to be that the means are not equal. You might do a one-sided test. You might, in fact, do have some alternative that only goes in one direction, because that's the only thing you care about, and nobody would care if it goes the opposite direction. But those cases are pretty rare, and you're going to have to defend the choice that you made to do that. We also talked about the fact we never accept anything. You reject a null hypothesis, or you fail to reject the null hypothesis. And also, that failing to reject the null hypothesis does not mean the null is true. If you miss that question, I might take an extra point off even if you were here immediately before, or you know, early every single day. Get that point. Failing to reject the null hypothesis means that there's not enough evidence in your sample to reject the null hypothesis. Could be that you have too small of a sample. Could be that you grabbed a biased sample. It could be, in fact, that there's nothing there. You know, I see several, if I see six 10,000 person studies, we don't need to run another study, maybe. But you know, there are a lot of reasons why we can fail to reject the null hypothesis. Most of us live in small study land with kind of what I'll call a convenient sample. It doesn't mean that we should change medical practice based on the results from that. And again, use two-sided tests. We talked a lot about p-values. So p-values, that's that smallest alpha the observed sample would reject the null hypothesis. Another way of thinking about it is given that null hypothesis is true, what's the probability of obtaining a result that's as extreme or more extreme than the actual sample? You're trying to measure the strength of evidence in your sample in that data that the null is not true. But another important one that I could take more points off of if I'm in a bad mood, the p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. You will never find a probability from a statistician that the null hypothesis is true or that the alternative hypothesis is true. So please do not tell me that. I might just reject your paper outright because I'm irritated. Not today. I have a whole bunch of manuscripts I have to review right now. How do you not interpret the 95% confidence interval? Do not tell me in that manuscript that there's a 95% probability the true mean lies between your two confidence values that you got from your, stand, from your study data. Do not tell me that you're 95% confident the true mean lies between these values. It's really hard to interpret a 95% confidence interval. To be honest, it's much easier when you start dealing with the meta-analyses. But many times, it's remembering what not to write. That's a very important task. Also remember, just because, so if they make the mistake of putting confidence intervals on each group, if they're overlapping confidence intervals, 
doesn't mean that you have non-significance. You have to actually do the correct test. So my take home message here, there is meaning and there is interpretation of confidence intervals. Those confidence intervals do give us some idea of the size of the difference between the groups, of the direction of that difference. And also remember, while there are lots of formulas, really, you're gonna probably bootstrap this. And in fact, also thinking back to sample size, we showed a very basic formula for, but these formulas expand. There's a lot more work. As Paul said, a lot of times we even run simulations to figure out a whole table of sample sizes that could potentially be relevant. And those are big tables. He showed you little parts of what are really very big tables. There's a lot of work that goes into this. I also want to point out kind of endpoints and analyses. You're going to be asked by a lot of different groups to designate what is your primary outcome. It is usually a single outcome, although sometimes not. And what is the primary analysis of that outcome? Then you're going to probably have a large list or a medium-sized list of secondary outcomes and secondary analyses. And occasionally also exploratory endpoints and analyses too. Those subgroup analyses that Paul was talking about, those subgroup analyses might be part of your secondary analysis plan. They might be part of exploratory analyses. But most of the world breaks into primary and secondary analyses and almost everything, including all those subgroup analyses, are in the secondary analysis. Usually, everything I say, you know, as you all very quickly picked up, by the way, you are one of like my fastest classes ever. I'm very excited, so thank you for that. And thanks to everybody who chose this class, you all are great. But you all picked up very quickly. It depends, is that the answer? Yes, it almost always it depends. So everything impacts your sample size and power. The variability of that data, the higher the variability in the data, usually means you're gonna need a higher sample size. Minimum treatment effect you wanna detect, the smaller that difference you wanna detect, bigger sample size. Type one and type two errors, you want higher power, you probably need a higher sample size. Now, if you're okay with having a larger probability of making a type one error, you can probably get a smaller sample size. But we tend to not like to make errors, right? Interclass correlation, higher the correlation, higher the sample size. So you've gotta get more data to, because really, each little piece is not adding nearly as much. You don't remember what that type one and type two error is? Here is the picture. Type one error, false positives, telling the guy that he's pregnant. Type two errors are false negatives. You're telling the person at nine months that she is also not pregnant. A little bit of lingo. I think Paul covered very well the number needed to treat I wanted to go back and remind folks also, because number needed to treat, positive predictive values and negative predictive values are what most clinicians actually ask me about. That's what they want to know. Now the positive predictive value is that probability that you are diseased given the positive test result. I always remember this by thinking, you know, if I have a positive HIV test, do I have HIV? If I have a positive pregnancy test, am I pregnant? Negative predictive value, probability you're not diseased given a negative test result. I tested negative for HIV, am I really negative? What's that probability? The little stick tells me I'm not pregnant, am I really not pregnant? What's the probability? Developing those predictive values depends on disease prevalence. Similar issues and difficulties come up with number needed to treat, and there are nuances to all of these numbers, and that's something that hopefully you've gotten this week. Every single thing we've talked about, there's the simple, but then you dig into it, 
Remember all those graphs? Well, I can create this whole set of numbers, and my data can look 20 million different ways. You have to dig in and look at the details. Nobody said clinical research was easy. You know, I have to be honest, when people say they want to be clinician researchers, I'm like, you're kind of crazy, aren't you? It's exhausting. There's a lot to do. There's a lot of good to do, but it is not easy. So what do we talk about in survival analysis? We talked about the fact that here you've got an outcome that isn't just a single number, it's not just systolic blood pressure, but you've got to define the event, the time origin, the time scale, and that time at which the event is going to be said to occur. That's why we call it time to event outcomes, time to event analysis. We learned that the Kaplan-Meier and log rank are great, but they're highly limited and they can be misleading at times. Cox non-proportional hazards can handle most of your situations, but in fact there are a lot of variations on the types of survival analysis you want to do and you need to really be careful choosing the exact type of regression and analysis you want to do. And that's true for all of your data. Repeated measures, like statisticians, they churn out lots of different ways to analyze data. We just don't tell most people about them. So you've got to really dig in and say, what is my question? What is my study design? How am I going to be analyzing or collecting the data? And what's the best way to answer my question? It all has to flow. Good protocols, manuals, and study manuscripts, this all leads to reproducible research. It's important that we are ethical in everything, but we also, part of that ethics is making sure others can continue our work. We didn't talk all that much about sensitivity analyses, but I think they're a really vital part of the analysis plans that I write and a really vital part to share with everybody. People in reading your manuscripts need to understand how robust your results are, and in particular with respect to missing data. And some people have talked about doing imputation and when you do linear mixed models, for example, was one of the questions, yes, you do get kind of an implicit imputation of missing data. However, sometimes it's not missing completely at random. Sometimes people fall out of the study for different reasons. And so when you do these sensitivity analyses, you're going to be kind of stretching the bounds of where you think that data could have gone and see if that actually changes your study results. But it's important that that information is in the manuscript because the readers are going to wonder, well, you lost 40 people, what would their data have shown? So if you talk about the sensitivity analysis in the manuscripts, people have a better idea that you were able to tell them, okay, well, what do I think? How robust were those results? Those good case report forms I just talked about, they should match your protocol and your data management systems. You should be collecting relevant data. Don't collect extra data. People all have time, and you want to respect that. Permit the efficient and complete data processing and analysis. These forms aren't just to grab data. They should be designed in a very clean and specialized way to help make sure and help make sure everything gets collected the way it needs to be collected, put where it needs to be put, and analyzed the way it needs to be analyzed. The way that as much as you can change on these forms to increase the efficiencies of your study and to decrease people writing the wrong number or typing in the wrong number, the better. Facilitate pooling of the data across studies. Good case report forms can help make sure that you are actually collecting this data in a rigorous manner everywhere. And you can talk to folks and say, are we all going to collect the same data across our studies so we can combine efforts later? Another really key element is that everybody has an ethical responsibility. Remember, many, many different things can jeopardize the public trust in science and research. We all have individual ethics and collective ethics and we have to take account of the people who are actually volunteering their time and many times their bodies to be in our studies. 
make sure that you take responsibility for that and also responsibility for the work that's being published. It is not fun being the person who stands up to say this is wrong. But sometimes you have to do it. Sometimes you may lose your job over doing it. I've taken my name off of manuscripts that I knew the analysis was wrong. They wanted to drive to a certain conclusion and it was done incorrectly. And if they had analyzed the data correctly, the conclusion would be different. And so I took my name off of it and I actually had to leave my job eventually. These are not easy things to do, especially when you are young in your career. But it is something that you may need to do in order to stand up for what is right. So also support your colleagues and make sure that if something comes up you need to think about. And sometimes it's not as easy a decision as you might want to think. It's not always, sometimes people have very good reasons to be making very different decisions. But it's important to think about and it's important to consider for every single person who's involved in our research structure. The other thing to remember is that we never know everything. That came up today in our lectures. The idea that a research nurse is going to be able to determine that an adverse event is related to the medical treatment or procedure, it's impossible. It's not even really his or her job. You know, we may have an idea, but a lot of times something expected may happen at that unexpected rate. That was a large portion of what Chuck was trying to talk about in critical care medicine. So you collect information. You record it so it can be analyzed and you analyze the data. I'm not just saying that as a statistician. I'm saying that because you know, my research nurse who hates numbers, hates statistics, she pounds this slide into people all the time. Now I'm going to go to kind of our meta-analysis. I know some of those slides were hard to see, and I'm going to try to cover the questions that have been raised and a couple of the key points. So starting kind of around his slide nine in that secondary analysis talk, and I should mention, so in Louise's talk, he actually gave a long list of different types of systematic reviews. Remember when I spoke after Chuck's lecture, I said, you know, he really, Chuck focuses on that 1A level. It was really good meta-analyses with randomized clinical trials and does a really good job of that. But there are a lot of systematic reviews and even other types of literature reviews that are of much lower quality. Or they just simply use different types of trials. So remember there are guidelines from Moose if you want to look at observational studies and not randomized clinical trials. There are lots of different types of reviews. So as you're reading the literature, keep an open mind. But some of the issues he brought up were Cochrane's Q statistic and I squared should be calculated. And he mentions you may want to consider meta regression when you've got an I squared greater than 30 and a P value that's less than 0.1. And so we're going to talk a little bit about I squared and also about that publication bias that should be examined and go through his funnel plot. So what is I squared? I squared is the percent of variance attributed to the study heterogeneity. I like I squared better than the Q statistic, I'll tell you, so we're going to focus on I squared. So I squared, the idea is that there's some total variation across all these studies in your meta analysis. And you want to know how much is due to the heterogeneity of the studies versus due to chance. So yeah, you can write that part down. That could be useful. The reason I prefer I squared to the Q statistic is that I squared is not driven by the number of studies in the meta analysis. It's actually not driven by a lot of elements that do drive the Q statistic. Now, the low I squared is a good thing. Increasing values show increasing heterogeneity. But realistically, this is now an opportunity. So when that I squared starts to get above 30%, 
that's when you say, I really need to look into why. So that's why he says, this is when you need to really get into that meta regression. So this is the Christmas tree plot. I couldn't make it, I can't actually change his graphics, I could only change the background. So I apologize. But if you look here, essentially what you do is you have each of the different studies and you say, okay, and so he has here the odds ratio of survival. But he says, all right, this is my odds ratio for the study. This is 95% confidence interval. I'm going to list a bunch of studies, and now I can try to compare them to each other. And what he pointed out was that in this one set of studies, there was an I-square of 70%. And the key one that stuck out was this one single study. And then he went on and talked about, you know, this was a single site study with a single investigator who did everything and lasted, I think, 10 years. I have more notes on this if we need it. But the idea was you go from here, of calculating that I square, putting all the studies together, investigating this, regardless of what size they were, anything else, you put everything in there, and you say, what seems to be different? And now let me dig into that to try to figure out what the truth is. Because for all we know, that one outlier is the truth. That was part of what he was trying to talk about with Corticus. So when you remove that one study, and he actually added in all of these other different studies, you have an I-square of 0%. It's really pretty interesting. And then he has his p-value for his pre-1989 um, studies and then also the post-1997 studies. And he went on and talked about why this data was changing over time. But this was that Corticus study. And so when Corticus is in there, you get an I-square of 25%. And so he then went on to say, well, you know, that's kind of near 30, so let's investigate why. So you take it out, you got 0%. But it's interesting, because when you do look at those post-1997 studies, you actually do get quite a bit of consistency. So he discusses that in his lecture. It's not something you need to know for the exam, but I wanted you to understand that there are different ways that you actually break this data out. And that what your job is, is to really dig in to say, if something's different, how do I figure out it's different? And you figure out by using the I-square. And then you start digging into what are the actual studies? Why might they be different? This is that Christmas tree plot, but turned on its side. And so now he has the control odds of dying instead along the bottom. But I just wanted to show you this because you can do Christmas tree plots in their usual way, like this, or on their side. So we'll go through this part. So. Another element from his talk, he talks about this balance. Do you include all studies or only the supposedly good studies? Well, meta-analyses or systematic reviews in general that include poorly done studies tend to limit the generalizability of the findings. So if you exclude those eh, not so great studies, you can't generalize very well. You know, there's a flip side to that, but it is something to consider. It's not a bad thing to include poorly done studies. Remember this funnel plot and the issues of publication bias, or he calls it the drawer bias, because you open up the desk drawer, throw the report in there, and don't even try to publish it? This is the picture of the funnel plot for the sepsis trials and low-dose steroids. So we have zero, which is the log odds of, or yeah, log odds ratio for death. We have the precision off to the side. So here, this blue line, this very thin blue line, this is where his um, meta-analysis was telling him he's going to find data. And then he plotted all of his studies. When he plotted his studies, we've got this big blob of blue over here. One little one over here, one kind of on like the zero, and a couple way up here that have higher precision. 
Now, when you kind of mathematically change the um, normal distribution curve, you can get these red lines. So if we weren't expecting publication bias, all those blue dots would be inside of the funnel. And instead, and they would be equidistant around this thin blue line. So what I would expect is that all these blue dots here and here and over there, they should be inside of here. I've got no data down here. That's because this data never made it to a journal. There's nothing here, but there's too much over here and a lot outside the red line. So what does that mean? It means people didn't publish everything. When you do a meta-analysis, a good systematic review, you actually start calling everybody. That's the reason those registries people were talking about are so important. I sometimes get blind emails. Hi, I'm trying to do a systematic review. I understand maybe you haven't published your paper yet or maybe you never published it, but can you tell me about the results? Because people look at abstracts, they look for poster presentations. They look for all these different places where data maybe would have been, but never got published in a journal. And then you have to go and try to find it in order to fill in all of these blanks that never got filled in. Remember, it's not just about the data you have. It's about the data that should have been there, but suddenly doesn't seem to be. So what's our general conclusion for the course? Realistically, there are a lot of different needs and a lot of different questions. It's all okay. What you should have hopefully remembered when you look back on this week is that you need a really rational way of thinking and creating knowledge and evaluating evidence. That it's vital that you do a really, really good job every single time you are doing research at every single stage. And that's not just clinical research. We focused on clinical research because it's clinical research week. But realistically, good preclinical data is vital. And a lot of the stuff we talked about this week is as applicable before you have a human in the study as it is afterwards. Really important to do a very good job and to be very careful all the way through. And to think ahead. Never think just about your current study. Think about the two to three studies coming afterwards and everything else that needs to happen. I want you all to really be thinking about these situations from multiple points of view. Each of us has our specialized training, but what makes you a great researcher, a great thinker, a good clinician and just a good person to talk to is somebody who can think from multiple different points of view. You're going to have your specialties, but think about a wide range of topics and surround yourself with a team of people who are going to disagree with you and people who are going to be able to complement your strengths. You need a strong team. No single one of us can now be Einstein anymore. We are not going to work alone. We all have to work as a good, solid team. You need to remember that ethics and statistics are your friends and regulatory too. We are all friends. We all have really common goals. And I know from many different countries and across many different people, we are all really trying to work together in order to bring that to truth. Oops. Nope, over here, thanks. You need to think across the research spectrum and continuum. We talked yesterday, you know, going from preclinical all the way to that dissemination and implementation research. Again, all of these different elements, when you are trying to plan or you're talking to somebody doing small laboratory research, if you're thinking about your animal studies and you're also thinking about your clinical studies, all the way across. What does the epidemiology help you do? 
What does the observational study tell you? What surveys do you need to do in order to best plan what that control group should be? How do you figure out the data that you need to collect that the patients and their providers and their caregivers are trying to really make decisions with, even though that's not what anybody else actually puts in their clinical trial? You've got to think about where you're going and also where you came from and what else needs to be filled in. But the most important thing about this class is that if you're not questioning more when you walk out that door, if we didn't actually help pass on knowledge that you can now pass on to your colleagues and at your different institutions and encourage everybody else to question and find answers in a fairly structured way, then we've failed. And I really don't like to fail. So I hope that all of you all feel empowered to be leaders where you are and to grow and continue to do a lot of great research. So on that note, I'll take your questions for a few minutes before we go and have pictures. Do you all have any questions? Raise your hands or your cards if you have a question. Don't go run to lunch yet because we have to take a picture in front of the castle. See how I can go from being rah, rah, yes, all right, no questions? You all feel great for the exam? I'm serious, I think you are some of the best, best students we've had in this class. I think you're gonna do fine on the exam. She says, hoping. No questions? All right, can we go ahead and do the photograph? Okay, so I guess that's in front of the castle.